Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Facebook Live. I am Dr. Mark Halstead. I am a pediatric sports medicine physician at Washington University Orthopedics in St. Louis. And uh, today uh, we are going to be talking about common myths of concussions and concussion treatment. So uh, just a little bit about me. So I um, specialize in pediatric and adolescent medicine and um, from a sports medicine standpoint. So I see the full gamut of injuries from musculoskeletal injuries to concussions, which is something I specialize in. I've had a, a large background working with the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, in developing their policy statements on concussion, both from the standpoint of just evaluating it for pediatricians as well as uh, a special interest of mine of getting kids back into school um, appropriately after concussions. And I will let uh, Jamie uh, introduce herself as our, uh, our co-host, co-guest. Hi everybody, I'm Jamie Bauerlein, a physical therapist at St. Louis Children's with our Young Athlete Center. I am similar that I specialize with the adolescent and pediatric sports and orthopedic injuries for physical therapy. I have been working with concussion patients for the past seven years, um, working closely with neurology, sports, sports medicine, pediatricians, helping kind of rehab and get these kids back into sports and back into school after concussion. Um, Jamie's been a valuable member of our team. We have a team approach to managing concussions and um, it's good to have uh, some colleagues that we can collaborate with uh, both from just evaluation and then also certainly for treatment because one of the things that we don't do enough of is talking about treating concussions. We think about for a lot of times, uh, we're just gonna let the athlete just not do anything. We're just gonna let them rest and hope that they get better, uh, which you know, when I started doing this 20 years ago now, uh, that was the approach. The recommendations from 2001 was that we would strictly rest um, individuals after their concussion. We would tell them not to do physical activity. We would tell them to reduce their brain work in order to get them better. Um, and that's our first myth that we're going to talk about is that no activity and putting someone into a dark room because we still heal that, hear that out there a lot of having the approach of the best thing is just put them in a dark room. And I always joke, well, how, how would you feel if you were told that, you know, you had an injury or a problem, we're just going to put you in a dark room and just stay there. Maybe we'll put some food under the door and, and hope for the best. And, and when you feel better, then you can come out. Uh, most of us don't do well with that type of deprivation of stimulus. Um, and I think that's one of the, the misconceptions that, that I think we need to talk about first is, is there's a lot of fear about this injury in the sense that we're going to make the concussion worse by either doing some light physical activity or even doing brain work, mental activity, doing schoolwork and things like that. And one of the things that I stress uh, a lot in our office visits with patients is that the only thing that really is going to make the actual brain injury worse is getting the brain injured again during their recovery. And so that would be, you know, going back out to play as an example for an athlete and getting hit again, that could potentially worsen the brain injury. But the actual act of making your brain work is not going to worsen the injury. It may worsen your symptoms and you may feel worse, but it's actually not making the injury worse. And I think that's a big distinction. And so one of the approaches that we have now is we start doing things like light physical activity. We want kids back in the school environment. We know that kids do better back in the school environment than staying home and not doing any work. But that doesn't mean they're doing everything back to normal. And so I'm going to let Jamie talk a little bit about some of the approaches that we do of how we evaluate these kids uh, from a physical therapy standpoint of how we can kind of gauge what level of physical activity is appropriate. So when they come to me, typically they'll come from some different physician out there. And when I'm looking through and asking them about their activity, I do everything from asking about what is their day-to-day -day classwork like? How much are they reading? How much are they getting up and moving around? What kinds of activities are they physically doing, both in school, in sport, at home? What is their day-to-day? -day? So when it comes to activity modification, key point is getting them back into school on that. And we do a lot of education on how to activity pace on some of those ones. So taking breaks, but then making accommodations throughout the day of how much workload's going on that. And then when it gets into the physical activity in sports, which is usually what these athletes really wanna get back to, um, we help go through a graded exercise exertion program. So whether it's, typically it's on a treadmill, but for some of those kids who have a lot of dizziness or a lot of neck pain, we'll have a bike test. And what we do on those tests is we grade how much we can actually make the kid work and how hard their heart rate is working and when those symptoms onset so that we have a very structured program from a cardiovascular standpoint 
of helping these kids understand how much they should be doing each day for their physical activity and what is their body ready to tolerate. And then we reassess in therapy appointments so that we're progressing them as quickly and as safely as we can to really get them back into those sport activities. And that's helpful information for us. You know, not every kid that we see with a concussion is going to necessarily need physical therapy services, but obviously if we have specialists like Jamie involved, that, that really helps us a lot. And that gives us further information. You know, what we may do as an example for a kid that may not go to physical therapy, I'll encourage them to do some light uh, cardiovascular exercise. And what we'll typically do um, without using the fancier exercise testing is I'll encourage them to either do some brisk walking or some light work on an exercise bike, but, but we give them rules with that. And so the rules we tell them is that they can do it. We start off with just a 20 minute of daily, daily activity, but we talk about limiting by their symptoms. So what that means is that if they're doing exercise and as they're, uh, if they start with a symptom, so say they have a headache and that headache starts to worsen, um, we'll stop. Or if they didn't have a headache or they didn't have dizziness and those things pop up, we'll stop for that day and then we'll, we'll try again the next day. So we're trying to keep it what we call sub-symptom training. So it's keeping them from making their symptoms worse. So that level of exercise tolerance that's helpful. We do know from research too that actually some of these uh, exercise tolerance, kids that have better exercise tolerance tend to improve quicker, which would make a lot of sense. Kids that have harder time with their exercise and they provoke symptoms sooner, they do tend to take a little bit longer. So it does give us a little bit of input too of what kids we may be a little bit worried about maybe taking a little bit longer or may take a little bit longer to get better in the long, uh, in the big spectrum of things. So moving on to another myth, um, kids shouldn't return to school until they're symptom free. Uh, that's something that we hear a lot, uh, unfortunately. Um, as I mentioned, I'm someone who's very interested in returning to learn uh, and getting kids back into the school environment. And there's two steps to that that we talk about. The first is getting kids back, returning to school, that actually physically getting them in the school. And there's a lot of harm, again, that, that people think is going to happen by letting these kids go back into the school environment, that they're, they're going to do a test or they're going to do some schoolwork, and that's going to worsen their concussion. And again, as I mentioned before, that's really not the case. So, so these kids may have symptom worsening. And, and again, we want to pace them throughout the school day. So I'll let Jamie talk a little bit more about that as far as some things that she talks about with, with patients. But, but that may be, you know, we give them a lightened workload or we do some things as far as giving them a break throughout the day. Um, you know, the, the important part of that is, is there's a lot of misconceptions too that, that a, you need a note from a doctor in order for that to happen at school. And that's really not the case. Schools have things in place that are there to help assist students who have medical conditions of all sorts, and that includes concussion. So some schools will maybe ask us as physicians to provide input, but we also try and get the schools to understand that they're the ones who actually manage the kids the best throughout the day. It's not, not us as physicians that are gonna be offering the best guidance. We, we, we try and avoid the extremes of no testing, no, no reading, all those types of things. There's no reason why we need to do that. We have research to back that up that shows even if we reduce the workload some, rather than eliminating it, kids are gonna recover at a very similar pace as if we don't take any restrictions and we just let them do, just plow through it, that's where they're gonna have the biggest troubles. And the ones that I see that having the biggest troubles are the kids that are the super high achieving students, uh, the ones that don't know how to ask for help, the ones that don't think that they can back off on any of their schoolwork because it's gonna set them back, even though in reality there probably is some, some non-essential work that they could back off on. Um, so that's where communication is really important. And I'll, I'll let Jamie kind of talk about a little bit how, how she approaches this when she sees uh, these kids from a therapy standpoint. Yeah, because when I'm seeing them, we have about an hour with each patient. We're super fortunate. So I have a lot of time to sit down and really talk through what a school day is looking like for each student. And depending on the age, grade level, school they're at, that's very different whether they have these block schedules of an hour and a half of a lecture or they have the shorter ones of 40 minutes. But these kids are typically struggling in school because they try to push through six to seven hours in a row of going through this comprehension, reading and scanning the board. And when they're coming to therapy, typically it's because they can't handle um, that amount of cognitive load and activity. Sometimes they have some ocular or balance deficits or dizzy deficits and things like reading and having to scan, looking from the board and back down can be really challenging. So when they come to see me in therapy, we do a lot of discussion of what their day's like and pinpoint what's really triggering the symptoms. And if it's an overload of going all day and not taking a break, we talk about how to work in rest breaks. And I'll work with the kids of, okay, you really feel like you need to be in math class, I understand that class right after is when you need to take a 20 minute break 
in the nurse's station and kind of activity paced that way. Or if it really is that looking up at the board and back down or having to read and scan, those can be really challenging when you have some of those ocular motor or vestibular deficits going on. It's triggering dizziness, it's triggering headaches. Sometimes the words are blurry, they're skipping lines. So I'll give them a lot of strategies of having the teachers print off the notes for them so that they just focus and listen to the teacher. They don't have to take notes or they get a note buddy if they don't like the teacher's notes, that's fine. Sometimes it's teaching them how to read the pages in a different way that it's less busy and easier for them to comprehend the information. And we'll work through those different strategies in the clinic. And a lot of the time it's, helping coach them how to advocate for themselves at school, whether it's the parent helping them or the student, because typically it's like Dr. Halstead said, these kids sometimes don't know how to ask for help. They don't wanna ask for help. And sometimes there's pushback from the schools because they don't know how to help the kids. So we'll sometimes just work and get the parents and kids to really just start advocating and give some recommendations, but it's not my, I'm not a teacher. I don't understand the coursework, what the assignments really are like but I'll help them navigate some of those avenues of how to get through the different classes. And one important, one important part of that is making sure that we are talking to those, that, talking to the kids about advocating for themselves. You know, one of the difficult parts about concussions uh, that we stress with these kids is that no one can see the symptoms that they're experiencing from the outside. So you can't see that person's headache. You can't see that person's dizziness. You can't see if they're getting blurry vision with reading. You can't see if they're having troubles focusing or concentrating until you start seeing the, the negative parts of that. They start to perform worse on their tests or they're not getting stuff in um, in time. And then when it gets to that point, then, then it becomes more of a challenge for that kid. They get frustrated about stuff if they haven't been communicating with their teachers about things. And it's a lot more difficult for the teachers to truly apply the proper adjustments because it's going to be different from kid to kid. It'll be different from class to class, depending on the stress in that class. You know, I, I'm super excited that, that we now have a resource for Missouri. Um, uh, one of my colleagues that I've worked with for a long time on Return to Learn, she, um, um, Karen McAvoy, she put together a program um, that's called, uh, there's a website called getschooledonconcussions.com. And on that website, it's a resource for educators and also for, for parents and, and physicians and what have you, um, anybody that's actually dealing with concussions. And it's got various tip sheets about things and strategies you can do to help these kids in school. But a really awesome thing we have now is at least for this year, for 2021, Missouri is one of 10 or 11 states, I think, that has free access for any teacher to a specialized um, part of that website that's called the TACT, which is it's, it's an individualized tool for teachers where teachers can put in their teaching style um, and put in you know, various things about how they teach and what maybe dealing, the kid may be dealing with. And it will give them weekly um, email updates as far as, well, what strategies can you be doing to help that kid to best support their teaching style, the kid's learning style, um, the subject that they're dealing with, and maybe the symptoms that they're having troubles with. So uh, it's a great resource. And I really hope that more people uh, around Missouri are using this um, over the course of this next year, because it, it's really, really helpful. And I think it will help the educators uh, understanding this concept uh, a lot easier for the future. Um, I would encourage anybody who's uh, watching, uh, if you do have questions for us, we, we are available to take questions. Um, so certainly um, fill those out and then we will, we will get to those uh, as they come in. Uh, another uh, myth that we wanna talk about a little bit is screen time uh, and uh, are screens bad? So let's let's talk about where the background of this came from. So so several of those statements that I mentioned, I had worked with the American Academy of Pediatrics on this, and we had put out statements talking about having uh, a reduction in the use of screens. Unfortunately, when we put out recommendations like that, people feel well. If we just reduce it, maybe if we eliminate it, then everything will get better quicker. So so more is more is better, right? Um, well, no. Um, so people took that extreme and then they started telling people, well, you cannot watch television after a concussion or you cannot um, use your screen. You cannot text message. You cannot use a computer at all. And, and again, because of the fear that it's going to make the concussion worse. Now we do know, and, and again, Jamie will talk about some of the strategies and things that they utilize um, through physical therapy. Uh, we do know that there are some dysfunction with ocular motor issues. So how your eyes are working and how they're processing things with your brain. And that can cause to have an increase in symptoms. We do know that just for any of us, if we're sitting in front of a screen for a long time, our eyes are going to get fatigued. We're going to get headaches. We're going to get loss of concentration. 
there was actually, and I hated the fact that this came out because it's really an inappropriate use of this term, but people were talking about during the midst of the pandemic uh, last summer, uh, when we were starting to see a lot of everybody's just, you know, trying to do everything through Zoom, they were talking about the term Zoom concussions. Uh, in the sense that a lot of people were experiencing many of the things that individuals experience who have brain injuries just because of prolonged use of screen. So, so it's not it's not the concussion itself. It's just sustained use of them. But that doesn't mean that we can't use them at all. And you know, again, we talk about you know not not putting kids in front of a television because it's too stimulating to the brain. But then on the other hand, we tell kids, well. Um, well, we don't want to put them in front of a TV, but but if we do, it's not it's mindless work. But so we can't have it both ways. We can't tell someone sitting in front of a TV is mindless and not educational at all. And on the other hand, we say that it's too mentally stimulating. So so again, it's it's pacing with these things. And so we can let kids use their phone. We can let kids text, but but we want to make sure that they're not just sitting there and doing it sustained. And and one thing I try and have them avoid if they do have sensitivity to light, I really discourage them from using those devices in dark rooms because now it becomes a very bright object and that is irritating to the eyes. And so we need to think about some strategies from that. But again, I'm gonna have Jamie talk about how we approach things from an eye standpoint uh, through rehabilitation. Yeah, so that's probably one of the first questions I get from parents is they shouldn't be on their cell phone, right? But I really actually want them to be to an extent because we've taken away so much other things of their life and their phones and their screen times, sometimes that's their whole social world. And this year has been exceptionally challenging because school's been on Zoom. So when it becomes irritating, if they had to in fall get on Zoom and be on the computer all day for school, we had to utilize some different strategies of just turning off the screen or flipping the computer around just for ocular breaks. So eye breaks for those kids so that they weren't looking at the screen all day but then they could flip it back around and watch part of it. And using strategies, because that contrast, kids love, teenagers really love to go into dark rooms and just use their screens. So just having it come from a medical professional sometimes works better than mom or dad yelling at them, but it's a big factor because it is a lot more of that bright contrast coming into their eyes that they really can't take. And they can look at a screen for a while. Like you said, it's that fatigue principle while they had an injury that were working on their oculomotor rehab, they do have to function and scan the screen and read throughout it, but we'll utilize similar strategies of decreasing the brightness if it's a contrast issue. We'll decrease the busyness of the background and teach them how to not have multiple tabs pulled up or take some breaks on those ones. A lot of it too, because there's very often a cervical component, kids love to look down at their screens. So very simply just getting them to elevate it up and doing some postural education when they're getting some cervical or neck-based headaches um, takes a lot to kind of teach them, especially because their desk situations this year with COVID have been really unique of what they've come up with to adapt at home. So we've had to get really creative on what they have available to them at home, but then again, desks at school sometimes aren't that great for them either. But we can control, at least the school has some set standards there, but at home we've gotten pretty creative of how to sit properly when they're reading, how to take screen breaks, but truthfully that's their social world in a lot of ways and I reinforce that to parents that we can't cut off their social connection, but the kids can make adjustments on their phones and activity pace where you know you're on it for 20 minutes and then you take a break, but you can sit there and watch a movie and if your symptoms aren't that bad, or they're not increasing, watch a movie with the family, but you have to keep the lights on and maybe sit a little further away instead of really close. That seems to make a really big difference that we aren't converging. So those eyes aren't working quite as hard on the screen when we kind of pace out how far away we are from some of those. Yeah, and some other strategies I talk to kids about too is just if they're having a lot of the eye strain or eye type symptoms, um, I'll encourage them on their phone to, to switch it to grandma and grandpa size font and really increase the font size. And they can even do that on their computer too, because if they're trying to focus on small little print, which sometimes is why the reading is an issue, depending on the size of the print in the book, um, sometimes can be a challenge for them just trying to navigate from line to line if the font is much smaller. So, so if you, you increase it, and actually some of my colleagues uh, elsewhere in the country have, have shown that 18 point font seems to be a lot easier on the eyes, uh, I'll encourage them to increase their font size and see if that helps alleviate some of their problems there as well. So, so those are things and strategies that certainly we can look at in trying to help these kids. Um, but, but it can be a challenge. I mean, there's no question about it. 
you know, we can argue the merits of social media and uh, overall in our mental health, but unfortunately it's here to stay. And, and it is, I mean, it's, it's a challenge even in my own household when we talk about, well, maybe you need to give up Snapchat for a little bit. And that is a, that's a endeavor in and of itself uh, if we were to say to do that um, with one of my kids. And so, you know, when we start talking to kids about concussions, there's a lot of unknowns with the injury, which is why this can be a challenge. We can't, we can't tell someone exactly when they're going to get better. It's not like a broken bone where we can, with good confidence, say within four to six weeks, this is going to be perfectly fine and you'll, you'll be back doing something. Or, you know, we tore a ligament, you had surgery, this is your expectation. You know, we can give some statistics, but every individual is different and every concussion is different. There's so many things that can feed into uh, what may make their symptoms worse. Um, they may have some associated injuries, which is some of the things that we've talked about with, um, with doing physical therapy for associated neck injuries, associated balance troubles, the vestibular system being a problem, associated eye issues. And, and if those things are there, those can complicate our recovery. So, so it, it can be a challenge. And so when you already have this nebulous, I'm not sure when exactly you're going to be fine. And then we start doing other things like, well, we're going to take your phone away until that's better. You, you've basically punished that kid. And that's not going to go very well for very long. Um, and, and then we're going to run into more troubles. And then we don't just see kids that have their concussion problems. A month later, I see kids that have a higher level of depression, and anxiety uh, because of their troubles too. And then now, now we're not only treating the concussion, we're treating their depression and anxiety, which mimic a lot of the symptoms of concussion. So it becomes even more gray as far as what's contributing to what. So it becomes even a, a bigger challenge. So Jamie, do you wanna talk a little bit about some of the eye issues that you may see when you're evaluating someone? Yeah, so when we use our eyes, we sort of take for granted what we naturally can do. So kids are gonna struggle with what I like to call gaze stabilization. So when we're able to hold an object and track it, across a room and we're able to look down at a paper and track across the paper and read smoothly. That system, because of where it's in, in the head and the vestibular system plays in there with those head injuries, it can become injured. And when that happens, you have to go through kind of retraining those muscles and neurons how to fire so that we can keep images stable while we're watching. And for kids, I tend to explain it to them. Like if you're watching a ball come into your glove and you're tracking it across the sky, those are the things that really aren't working for you right now because they don't like to hear the correlation to school necessarily. They love to figure out how it associates with sports. Um, and it's the same thing that when we're walking and we're able to keep an image in focus as it gets nearer to us, we call that convergence. So that's how two of our eyes work together to keep something in focus on those ones. And those can tend to be injured as well. And that's a really common one, especially if somebody's having difficulty navigating busy environments in the school hallway or they're having a hard time looking from the board or back down to the book, that's using convergence all day. And that tends to be a really big issue for them that's very easily managed with physical therapy once it's identified on those. And the other big one, it's this reflex we have that we can be running and moving our head, but everything in front of us stays in focus. And we'll test that in the clinic. And that's really common to be involved. We call that our vestibular ocular reflex. And it's two systems working perfectly in tandem that can get involved. And I tell athletes, you use this system just sitting in a classroom when you turn your head and you keep things in focus, let alone when you're out on the ice skating and trying to track a hockey puck while you're moving side to side really fast. So we kind of correlate all those to sports for the kids, but also to school. And each of those systems are very different in what type of exercises we're gonna give them in the clinic, but that's kind of what we tease out when they come in. And that's why they have these symptoms in so many different environments out there. Yeah, I can definitely have a challenge. So, so a couple of things, I think at this point, you know, uh, I don't see anything that's come into the chat. So just kind of kind of resummarize a little bit as far as some common myths here before we wrap things up. So uh, one, it is okay to do a little bit of light physical activity. We're not talking about, again, back to their normal sports and sports participation and sports skills, but we do encourage some light cardiovascular activity. Uh, we discourage the dark rooms. Uh, we do want kids getting back into the school setting sooner rather than later. Uh, and again, we wanna do that with proper adjustments through the school um, and that can be done easily and schools do have the capability of doing that. And uh, it is okay to use screens, but again, in moderation as it is for all of us. 
Um, so just to kind of give you a little background as far as kind of, you know, just for wrapping things up. So uh, I'm available as a concussion specialist. I, I see patients in two offices. I uh, see patients at the Children's Specialty Care Center in town and country uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then on Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays, I'm at our Progress West office in O'Fallon. And Jamie, you can talk about where you're at and when. Yeah, so I am at the Children's Specialty Care Center Monday through Thursday, um, eight to six most of those days on those ones. So I primarily work here in town and country now. Um, typically to come see me, you're gonna go to a physician first and they're gonna kind of screen that actual need for physical therapy, um, be it from your primary care, a neurologist, a sports medicine physician, Dr. Halstead who specializes in concussion. Um, but yep, yeah, I would definitely be your second point of contact on that one. So great, thanks for joining us today. We hope you uh, got some good information out of this and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.